Everybody still up, still awake? Yeah. If you need to, there's some Diet Coke in the back, you know, <clears throat> for another uh, a drug, caffeine, get you. Uh, I just want to thank Sue for her amazing energy and, uh, and organizing this because isn't there a huge vacuum out there? <clears throat> <clears throat> so agree or disagree on the issue, you got to know that we need more discussion and dialogue and debate on such an important issue to the public. Um, its impact on health, public safety, um, the development of our children, education, our quality of life. I, I mean, it is significant, but of course, it's just happening right underneath us. And I say that because I, I have very much the same story as President Carter this morning. Um, I used to not think much of it when I was a member of Congress. Uh, like many of my colleagues, I, you know, I have all the members of my family, my mom, dad, brother and sister, have all had cancer. And when my brother had cancer, you know, he was in the early stages of testing out chemotherapy and he was sick all the time. So my bent is I would not begrudge anybody um, the usage of anything that would mitigate the impact of chemotherapy. I mean, that was my initial feeling about medical marijuana. I thought, you know, there, is, there are people out there who would get important relief from this, and I don't want to begrudge it. That was my kind of lay take on this. And, uh, I, like most people, was lulled into this false sense of security. You know, it's all about medical marijuana. And then the other position I had was, I've been taking on the war on drugs, you know, I, as a public official, so I know the war on drugs has ended up, as President Carter said, a war on people, particularly African Americans and other minorities in this country. Um, as President Carter said, our incarceration rates have just skyrocketed. It's an indictment on America that as leader of the free world, we incarcerate more of our people than any other free industrialized nation in the face of the earth. I mean, we're up there with countries that we would not want to be in keeping with in terms of the number of people we put in jail in this country. It's an indictment more on us as a people that we've never come up with a better way of dressing our public safety issues than to lock everybody up. It's, a, it's really a troubling thing. And that there's a for-profit industry. Let me just make a side kind of note that the notion that these laws are passed by another for-profit industry that's trying to maintain their quotas and therefore all these two strikes and you're out, three strikes and you're out, all these state laws are really being pushed by the for-profit uh, prison industry for, for a profit. Let's just understand that that's what's driving our crimin criminal justice policy. Um, troubling thought that that's what's guiding it. Anyway, so let me back up. So those are the two things that really made me feel like I don't want to be on the side of locking people up and, and marking them for life, for a, a conviction, for s smoking a few joints. That's, that, I, I am against that. And so just like President Carter, that's my feeling. And the medicinal uses, like I said with my family, that's why. And of course, I, I, I left Congress and I you know, was thinking about how I wanted to continue my public advocacy for mental health because I'd been the sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And I you know, started going around trying to see how this law was going to get implemented and talk to various people around the country. And of course, you know, when I left Congress, it was just around the time of these campaigns to legalize, and I thought, that's never going to happen. You know, the, you know uh, and medical marijuana is one thing, but this notion of legalization. And of course, I woke up after the passage of the law in your states, and uh, you know, I said, oh my god, this is going to go in the opposite direction of mental health, parity, and addiction equity, because basically, you know, you can't be going in, in two different directions at the same time. You can't be preserving people's mental health 
and protecting them against addiction on the one hand, and then starting, as you've heard so eloquently by all the previous speakers, a new commercialized industry that you know, has as its base uh, a profit uh, motive to, to get people to use it because that's how they make their money. So uh, I quickly saw how rapidly we went from you know, the restricted availability in a very confined way for medical use and how that became a Trojan horse. The Trojan horse because, as you know, even medical marijuana became a joke when you see the impact, and Kevin will take you through the experience of those uh, in terms of who gets medical licenses. Not the people that I was imagining when I said, hey, no big deal, when states wanted to experiment. It was, it's frankly a totally different story. So I quickly realized, and then of course uh, Nora Volkow put me on the NIDA, Friends of NIDA board, so I had Nora kept telling me about the impacts of this new quote, genetically modified marijuana. I kept thinking, you know, marijuana that, you know, I grew up with and I started realizing, no, you know how much the American public hates this genetically modified anything. I mean, this new marijuana is genetically modified to increase potency, minimize the uh, uh, counter effects of that psycho effect that it creates through THC. I mean, it is, you know, a whole different drug. It's more hashish than it is marijuana as we traditionally know it. So I kind of was learning all this stuff quickly and I said to myself, there's something that has to get out there in terms of making sure people like myself who are public policy makers know what the facts are. And yet there didn't seem to be any place that I could go where there'd be a central repository that could collect this information. So I had known Kevin. Uh, when I was in Washington and I knew of his efforts in this regard, so we talked about it. We were bemoaning that there needed to be kind of a political vehicle to give voice to the experience of these states that had gone forward so that other states, by the way, like my own in Rhode Island, don't end up following suit in the cases where maybe Rhode Island doesn't want to end up having to relearn those old lessons that that uh, Washington learned or Colorado learned in the path to, to legalize. In, in other words, why do we have to pay the tuition fees twice in terms of lessons learned? And so the idea of Sam as a public uh, official is that I want to make this, these, all these briefings that you heard so eloquently today available in a cogent way to my colleagues. Now, I also come from the state legislature. So I was a state rep for six years before I went to Congress. So I know when you're in state houses, you don't have a lot of people with giving you information because you don't have big staffs. So uh, you know, I know there's a huge value on information. So that is what we created SAM for, Smart Alternatives to Marijuana, is to provide a vehicle for state legislative decision makers to have an experience, have the knowledge that can be disseminated from other states. In fact, that's kind of what NCL, National Council of State Legislators, and others try to do is share what's going on in other states so that other states can benefit from their colleagues' experience. That's the, the basis of it. So um, I'll let Kevin uh, to kind of take you through the slide deck, but, but just to uh, reiterate, um, I just hope that you can help us um, from what you've heard today, uh, you know, figure out what would be useful to you as, as state officials in being able to get, as Sue said, the most cogent public health information out there. Because I hope that the information will speak for itself. And, um, and this is not uh, anything that is partisan in the sense that all we want is it to be transparent. What are the messages and what can be backed up with the science? And as you heard over and over again today, the science of the tobacco exper uh, experiment is well known. So we kind of use that as a um, kind of a, a way of measuring what we can expect from legalization of this drug. And the experience in liquor can certainly also be, in the alcohol industry, can also serve as a very powerful example of what we can expect. So for those people who say, oh, we don't know what the future holds, and oh, it's going to be all you know, roses, 
you know, it's really important that we've had these terrific presenters today kind of really re-educate us on you know, this history of the alcohol and tobacco industries in our country because they are so telling. We don't need to kind of, you know, try to guess what's going to happen. We have some pretty good examples of what has happened in the two other major um, legal drugs, not to mention, you know, uh, you know the, the expansion of prescription drugs and what, that, what havoc that's wreaking on our society. So the, I guess the uh, one argument I want to attack is this notion that, well, we've been, you know, this has never been successful, so let's just throw up the white flag. Let's just throw our hands up. Uh, now I speak as a new father. Um, I have two children, five and one, and I've got another one coming in November. Uh, and all through the blessings of recovery, by the way. I don't want my little boy to be crawling in his neighbor's apartment who has, meta, has a marijuana brownie because he puts everything in his mouth. My little boy, if he were walking in here, he'd find every crumb on the floor. <laughs> and we laugh. But that's the honest to God's truth. I'm terrified of a society where my child's health can be jeopardized. And I thank Sue for this because this is personal to all of us. I have passed on to my baby a genetic predisposition for addiction. It's run deep in my family. And I know that I want to reduce the harm every way I can because I know that I escaped by, the, by, by God's grace. I escaped killing myself from drugs and alcohol. I've had other family members who haven't been so lucky. And this is a serious issue. And I know it's serious to all of you, you wouldn't be here. And so I want us to be very mindful of how accessible, how available, um, whether you know, directly or indirectly, marijuana is going to be in our society. And, when, and that is why I am here today. And I want to thank all of you for your attention and pass it over to Kevin. Thank you, Patrick, and just thank you for your friendship and leadership on this issue. It's been uh, incredibly inspiring to so many people. Um, it's difficult for me to follow all of the amazing speakers that we've had so far. Uh, I just, again, I want to thank everybody who has contributed and everybody around the tables here. Uh, for our discussions at lunch and, and during the break time. Uh, this has been one of the most interesting and important meetings on drug policy that I've probably ever been to. And I've been doing this for 18 years. The first year was when I met Surushi when I was about 16 and a half years old. And um, I met her in Washington, D.C. while at the time she was working on uh, closing open air crack markets that were going on in Atlanta at the time with inner city families in action. And I was uh, in Southern California dealing with a MDMA epidemic of ecstasy that was killing my friends. Um, and we were trying to figure out why um, in the mid to late 1990s and, and sharing stories and notes about how, how we were going to work to think that 17 years later, we're going to be here talking about marijuana policy is pretty unbelievable. So thank you, Sue, for your friendship also. Um, I want to sort of to bring us back, talk about you know what the purpose of Project Sam is, and really, you know, so we feel that the debate in this country has been uh, characterized by a false dichotomy. That on the one on the one hand, we can stick with what everyone knows doesn't work, our old failed lock em up policies with regards to drugs and particularly marijuana. Or we can try something new, something where we can put our hands around it, exert some control, uh, some regulation, maybe make some money off of it in the meantime um, through legalization or regulation. And what we're trying to talk about with Project Sam is first to acknowledge that all policies have pros and cons. So not, not one policy will simultaneously get rid of the black market, reduce underage you know, use, um, stop addiction, um, et cetera, et cetera. That, that really, when we're you know, talking about this exercise and, and the person who's been thinking about this the most comprehensive way in the country is right here, John Calkins, um, taught me is that every single policy 
really does have pros and cons. And, it, and it's a matter of weighing those pros and cons and at least acknowledging what they are, even if we have different um, opinions, whether what's more important. Is getting rid of the black market more important than, um, than reducing use? Is keeping free speech more important than worrying about public safety? And so, unfortunately, though, with this legalization debate, we have not had that discussion. Right? We, we have only really heard this idea that you know, marijuana can simultaneously cure cancer, get rid of the black market if we legalize, um, and help uh, weak state budgets make up some money. And we haven't heard what possible downsides. I'm saying in the country we have not heard this. Today we've heard a lot about it, but in the country we have not heard this. So the debate has been uh, unfortunately dichotomized. So what the underpinning really of Project SAM is the idea that you can be in favor of social justice and health and worrying about black markets and worrying about kids without being in favor of legalization. In fact, if you're in favor of a robust public health care system and especially mental health care system in this country, it's actually inconsistent um, with this idea of legalization. Um, right now, we're on a fast track without a proper discussion of the costs and consequences of, of what such a policy could be. And so we, you know, Project Sam really offers this in a, in a new way. Um, the why do we care part is really what most of us have talked about today. So I'm going to speed through these very quickly just in terms of, you know, we talked about this. I don't know if this specific graph has been shown, but the issue of perceived risk and use over the last 50 years. You know, if there's one truism in prevention, it's that we know that attitudes predict behavior. Um, and, and that's important to know. We know, again, this is what all the experts here said today, we have already two legal industries that promote use among kids um, and, in fact, rely on addiction. They, you know, putting out phony um, uh, uh, taglines like enjoy responsibly, you know, as David would say, the joke about that is if every alcohol um, uh, company wanted everybody to enjoy responsibly, they'd all be out of business, right? They don't make money from the people that enjoy responsibly. Um, and we talked already about how the taxes are, uh, when I first read that statistic, a fifth of what they were when you adjust for inflation during the Korean War, I, first of all, I had to look up when the Korean War was, because I wasn't exactly sure. But Wikipedia told me it was about 20 or some years before I was born. And you know, the idea that it's a fifth of that um, was pretty re remarkable. This, I think, is something to remember that we don't hear about in these debates, which is essentially that for every dollar society gains in alcohol revenue and tobacco revenue, we spend 10 in social costs. So, you know, I think, you know, this idea that we've heard over and over again that gambling will be the um, savior of our public health education. How many of you are from a state with a lottery that has saved public education? Wait. Georgia. Saved public education? All right, one out of 50. Um, we, we know that that's really a false promise and that, and that this idea that we can just pay for whatever extra costs there are with legalization and increased use with our revenues, we've never had that happen before. So I, I, I don't know why we would necessarily expect that from marijuana. One thing we hear a lot is, you know, if we only treat it like alcohol, we'll have less criminal justice costs, right? Less involvement in the criminal justice system, but especially um, people that are arrested and then get saddled with records. Well, you do some digging and you actually see that the vast majority of people that are arrested are not arrested for marijuana when, talks, when looking at drugs. In fact, they're not arrested for crack, heroin, and everything else combined. They're arrested for nonviolent alcohol-related violations. So I'm not even talking about alcohol-related homicide. I'm talking about things like the costs of regulating alcohol, which are you want to you worry about the roads, so DWI. You worry about sales to minors or in certain states, sales on Sundays, etc. That's a, that's a violation. And you worry about public intoxication. Those three categories on alcohol are four times as prevalent as our marijuana arrests. Um, and again, I don't think most of the American people, when you talk about alcohol, you know, it's legal. We don't, we don't have prohibition. What do you mean? You're arrested for it? We don't think of it like that. Um, but it's something that we haven't considered. This was touched on earlier, but one thing that is really the reason why we now have, I'm very proud to say on the board of Project SAM, the head of most major health associations now, with the head of IMRSA, um, the head of the Pediatrics Association that deals with this. This is the graph that gets them every time. <laughs> and it's the issue that we've all talked about, that this isn't your Woodstock weed. Right? This is five to 10, depending on when you're looking, times as harmful. And the non-psychoactive ingredients like CBD, we had a um, discussion today about that. 
when we started tracking CBD, 1985 to 2009, I mean, it's just, there's no comparison in terms of that ratio, which was said earlier. Um, and, and I think that is all obviously very problematic. I'm not going to go through all this because Sue went through the tobacco industry documents, but uh, you know, it's fascinating every time I do it because I think that if every American saw what the tobacco industry did and actually could read the RJR confidential memos that were literally drafted days after these same executives testified under oath at Senate committees that they would never touch youth, that this is only for responsible users 21 and over, 18 and over, I think we would have a prohibition of tobacco in this country when people saw this. Just how egregious in terms of targeting girls with apple flavored cigarettes, in terms of targeting young boys with Winston men and making sure the Winston man is between 20 and 28 so it looks like the guy you want to be when you're 14 and you're looking up to somebody. I mean, just, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. And I think this has been pretty scary. So I want to go through, uh, so all those have been said. This, I don't know, this is some new data that um, I really had very little um, to do with, but Dr. Chris Thurstone, who of course served on, was the uh, medical and treatment representative on the board that was coming up with the regulations in Colorado. Um, some recent, very new data that he has after looking at what you could arguably say was a de facto legalization that began in Colorado with much more open rules about medical marijuana that started around the mid to late 2000s, right? Like 2007, 2008 in terms of uh, more uh, the advertising and in terms of these dispensaries that were really, you know, as we all know, the medical marijuana programs are not all alike. Hawaii is not Colorado, is not Vermont, is not New Mexico, is not California. They're all very in scope. Um, and what they allow, but obviously Colorado was one of the more open ones, um, again, funded by those same people and also California. And I think we're already seeing, we've already seen the advertising begin. We've already seen this. It's not that we can sort of think about what this might look like with marijuana. In fact, when David was doing his presentation, um, I, I took notes and sent it all to the staff that, no, well, one person, staff that I have, saying um, that we need to copy exactly what David just did for alcohol because we have everything already for marijuana and, and it's there. We don't have to wait for it. Um, the, the, you know, all sorts of flavored sodas and, and food items, et cetera, cartoon characters that are targeting kids. Um, the vending machines that we spent so long and so much time and effort to ban for tobacco, we now see emerging for quote unquote medical. This is medical, by the way. And the, the um, I believe it's medican.org is the company, or .com. Um, they, they actually send out a daily newsletter about the business projections of medical marijuana in this country. Um, and we're seeing this all around the, the country. This particular one was in Massachusetts and came there. Um, and because Massachusetts just passed medical. Um, and, and so let's make sure the data I'm going to show us from Colorado, not necessarily all these pictures. But my, my point is that we're, we're now seeing this. And you know, I was just in um, Columbus, Ohio speaking at a, at a thing. And uh, there was a tobacco, what I thought was a tobacco vending machine um, from across the room. And I, I thought to myself, wait, didn't we ban those? Uh, how, how is that still there? So I definitely thought it was some kind of museum exhibit or something in the middle of the Marriott Hotel. And I went closer to it, and by golly, it was a tobacco vending machine. And I tested it with some quarters, and I got a pack of Marlboros. Um, and you know, even when we thought we got rid of those, it, it's still there. But anyhow, we, we know that they're here for marijuana. So I'm not going to go through all this data one by one, because you have it in front of you, but essentially the kinds of things that Dr. Thurstone, who runs one of the biggest treatment centers for adolescents in Colorado, are fi is finding is that um, when there was this increase in what I would call the commercialization of medical marijuana and dispensaries, we have seen uh, increases that are not proportional to the increases nationwide, that we've, you know, because nationwide substance abuse treatment for marijuana has been going up pretty steadily since the uh, mid-90s. But we've been seeing um, increases in emergency room, uh, for example, admissions for marijuana, things like um, drug-related uh, or accidents with THC positives. Um, at this time, in 2006 to 2011, so that's the latest data that we have, 
um, is that during that time there was actually a reduction in car crashes overall and in drug-related crashes overall in Colorado, whereas we did see a doubling between 06 and 11, we'll have to see what happens in 2012 and 2013 given the regulations that came in 2010. But let's be very clear, the regulations in 2010 though did not, I mean, the, the number of dispensaries and the number of, uh, the, the level of advertising and commercialization, you know, is still today pretty rampant. Um, not due to anyone's fault, but because there is an industry. And um, so, I, you know, what's interesting is to see if that legislation in 2010, what effect that had. But there's no doubt you go today um, and you're seeing the kind of commercialization that we saw start in around 07, 08 that we hadn't seen before. In Dr. Thurstone's substance abuse treatment clinic, 74% of young people who came into treatment said they received marijuana or uh, from either a dispensary, they had a card, or they had a friend, an older sibling. Um, that had a card that in some way they received their medical their marijuana from medicinal um, and then in his in the primary care clinic so in, P, in kids just going to the uh, pediatricians about one in five 18 or so a little less than that um, kids when asked where their source of marijuana was from said it was either they knew that the marijuana they smoked was from a dispensary that either they got themselves or that an older sibling um, uh, received which I think is interesting I'm going to go forward more. This was interesting that we saw, of course, this is just very early. We don't know what the effects of legalization are, but one um, uh, news article that we saw was released by a drug testing company in Colorado that actually receives the workplace positives. And the drug testing company saw that after the, just the passage of, of legalization, and it had gone down from September to October, October to November, it was starting to increase, um, just the, the mere passage of it without any regulatory framework. Um, it was very interesting how the nanogram level of THC in terms of the amount found in the system grew. Now, whether again, whether that stays or not, we have no idea, but it warranted the drug testing company um, enough to uh, want to put this out in a press release just to show their, um, their results. Again, early uh, pieces of data that we have to obviously keep following. Um, I'm not going to go into the things about, about kids. Look, I think it's been a mixed bag on the regulations in Colorado, and I only sympathize with the <laughs> regulators that are here and, the, and from both states and the legislative officials. Um, but what we've definitely seen is that there is a massive marijuana industry that has already emerged. Um, and they have influenced and been influencing these regulations at every turn. So the issue of the 100 people to one, as Derek said in Washington, was the same in Colorado. Um, the issue of you know, rebuking every single scientific study, whether it was the IQ study, whether it's driving studies, um, uh, and, and bringing those and influencing the, the system, we, we've seen that already. Um, I think a lot remains to be seen because the, the legislature and the governor still have to, you know, finalize everything. Um, you can't have, you know, things like edibles that people are really worried about. We, we looked at the rules, you know, you can't have things like that, that resemble certain brands that already exist, like Hostess Twinkies that are, you know, THC laced. Um, but the industry, as some blogs that I've read, they are happy because there are no explicit restrictions, for example, on character packaging, edibles, and candies. Now, it does say in the rules that it should not market to children. But obviously, that's open to interpretation. And they will be following the same playbook as the alcohol and tobacco industries when, when the tobacco industry said and spent about a billion dollars on the premise that Joe Camel was not um, targeted for kids, even when you know, the, the, they do the studies with the six-year-olds who were able to identify Joe Camel as part of cigarettes. Um, so th this is the kind of thing that we're worried about. The advertising, I think they did a very valiant effort in saying that, for example, things like high, magazines that promote marijuana or anything that promotes marijuana has to be classified with pornography, you know, behind a, behind a shelf. Um, we're now seeing that will be challenged by the marijuana industry on First Amendment grounds. In fact, the minute that was released, they sent out a press release saying that they will be challenging that. They will be challenging every single advertising restriction that the state tries to impose. So I, mean, I think the point is, and how I feel about the 12 regulations that, we're, that you've all come up with, which I heartily endorse, is that 
it, you know, they're very good regulations, but the difficulty will be when an industry takes hold and decides what it's going to challenge and what it's not, you know, and we're sort of beholden to that process. And I think that's what is, what is scary. So again, as I talked about before, what are our choices for policy? Is it that or is it lock them up or prohibition? Um, you know, we think it's not about either of these things. We can be against legalization in favor of common sense. And so we launched Project SAM and now have local affiliates over the country. But essentially, it's four main pillars that we're focusing on. The first is just to get the information about the science out to the American people in ways they can understand. I mean, I have to tell you, I was saying earlier with the data that was put, I think probably about 50 people in this country understand the science regards, regarding addiction uh, and the brain and marijuana and, and the addictive potential and what those rates are. I mean, I think it is so ill understood. And when you look on the internet and you Google marijuana addiction, I mean, good luck in terms of what you are, you're going to find out if you're a, um, you know, inquiring 18-year-old who genuinely wants to know. It's, it's really difficult. So we do need to get the science out. We also know that current policy isn't perfect, nor is it very desirable. I mean, there are things, for example, that President Carter talked about and Patrick's talked about many times with regards to criminal records. You know, does it make sense? for a 30-year-old applying for a job to not be able to get that job based on an arrest that he might have had when he was 17 or 18. Um, I was recently presenting this to a group of the National Narcotics Officers Association. And when I presented this second pillar, I was sort of shuddering and waiting for the, for the blowback. And the, a chief of a major sort of but rural area, um, who, a narcotics officer, raised his hand and he said, you know what? Um, thank you for actually bringing this up in this kind of forum because, you know, and, and what, basically what he said is, is his grandson was in a car where, that got pulled over. There was a bong in the car. He was driving the car. Everybody denied that, said it wasn't theirs, but as the driver, he got the charge for paraphernalia. And three years later, he was rejected from the first two jobs he applied for that he really wanted. And the third one, he was able to get. But there, was, there were those hurdles. So we do have those, hur those, those road bumps that we need to smooth out. Um, but we shouldn't, you know, uh, the legalization groups, I think, have really seized on that and seized on people's compassion and said, well, if you're in favor of repeal of, of criminal records and you don't want people to have all these horrible consequences, then you're with us, then legalize. And, and again, this has been the problem. The third is what we've been talking about all day, really to prevent this industry. You know, what I say to people is if legalization was about, you know, my old friends at Berkeley um, smoking a, a joint at People's Park, you know, w w singing Kumbaya, um, I really could care less uh, in terms of the spectrum of drug problems that we're dealing with. The issue is it's not about that. It is about an industry. It is about repeating the nightmare that David's trying to, you know, uh, 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 document uh, with very little funds. The, you know, the, the 60 million or whatever the, the figure was, $23 million of, of uh, advertising for every 1 million of prevention. I mean, that's what this is about. And if when I'm in Europe talking about this, and you have the representative from Liechtenstein raise their hand and say, well, we have these, we don't have a First Amendment, we have these EU trade rules, we have this, we have that, we could do it in a smaller way. That's a very different real world scenario than we have as we're talking about First Amendment issues. And so unless we're having a constitutional convention and changing that, I just don't see how we can beat an industry or rely on an industry to police themselves. And fourth is this issue of medical, which we haven't really talked about very briefly, but um, the bottom line with that is we want to produce um, non-smoked medications based on marijuana. We do know that things like CBD can be helpful. We do know that, um, that, that there are other cannabinoids that we have, we, we still need to learn much more about. We also know we don't smoke medicine and that people should probably keep getting their medicines from their doctor and their pharmacy as opposed to a separate system in a state uh, that's passed by voter referenda. So, we need to look at that. We've talked about Sativex, but there are others, other ideas. And really, frankly, in the meantime, for the truly sick and dying, the less than 2% of people, remember, that have cancer, AIDS, or glaucoma, less than 2% in the states with medical marijuana that are utilizing and have those, we should allow them access to a version of marijuana that was helpful for them in the meantime um, before these medications are developed. I think it's a very simple answer. But, but instead, we've gone the voter referenda way and opened up 
to a de facto medical to the point that the head of normal is now saying, you know what, yeah, we've had legalization in California since the mid 2000s, um, really. I mean, you think we don't, it failed in 2010, it didn't. We've had it in the form of medical because you can go with a headache and get it. Rec a recent study, 44% of people had headaches, 47% stress. That was their main uh, identifying condition. So rather than make it as a joke, let's make it a real medication and do so in a way that's not, you know, that is cost effective for people as well. So, you know, w one of the things that the SAM group is going to be doing, if I can talk about it, is this idea of a model law or some guidelines for state legislatures as they want to go on and be proactive on this issue rather than stick with the same old. So. A lot of this is going to be familiar to people in this room, but it is, they are radical ideas to, to you know, in terms of the status quo. I mean, having increased scre uh, screening and brief interventions in health settings, for example, or for people that are arrested, imagine if we, we took that arrestee and rather than put them in the local jail for four hours and give them a criminal record, if we actually had a health screening to see if they had a marijuana problem or not or to see if actually the reason they were selling to their friend is they have an issue about job opportunities because they live in an area where there aren't those opportunities. Those are the kinds of things that we're trying to promote with, with Project SAM. We can have a marijuana reform law, and we should. Um, doesn't have to equal legalization, though. It could, it could equal something else.